Hello, everyone, and thank you for once again joining us for Prop Talk. It's a property management podcast that's powered by Resman, an Inhabit company. I'm Elizabeth Francisco. Hopefully you've listened before, but if not, I'm the CXO of Inhabit, which stands for Chief Experience Officer. So there's a certain level, a certain bar that I feel like I have to deliver in this moment with you. You deliver. I've, uh, I've seen you. Okay. Because <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> um, and I'm super excited today because we have a wonderful guest that is joining us for today's episode, which we are calling Centralization 2.0. I don't think there could, I don't recall there ever being as hot a buzzword as centralization um, being used and thrown around in the industry um, like like centralization has over the last two years. And you know, the, the concept of centralization really means different things to different people. So uh, today, Jindo is going to help me dive into kind of his perception. And we're going to talk about centralization 2.0. Okay. But we're also going to get to know, get to know you a little bit. Because okay. I just spent lunch with you and you're pretty awesome. Thank you very much. I try very hard. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots to talk about. And like I said, Hottest topic out in the industry. So, okay. well, welcome to Prop Talk. Hello, hello. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So, I want to start with, because um, I feel like I have privileged information, just uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself, because there, you know, people that don't know you or haven't been exposed to you yet, um, you're just such an incredible entrepreneur and visionary in the things that you've done and the challenges that you've overcome. So I definitely, we're definitely going to dive into all things centralization, but I, you know, shame on me if, if I don't share what I know. So, okay, go, go. do you so, want me just to yeah, share what just I tell, Yeah. Tell us a little about how you got started, um, in multifamily, but also kind of where you came from, cause that's going to be relevant in some of the, yeah, the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I grew up in Australia, uh, so the accent isn't, um, isn't Irish. People was like, is it Irish? I'm like, <laughs> that's the weirdest thing to say, but, uh, it's, it's, it's Australian. <laughs> Maybe because I don't look Australian. Maybe I'm not a blonde, blue-eyed surfer. So but, you look Irish? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, Irish? Can you? Could you go Scottish? My but, husband's Irish. I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I don't seem Irish. But yeah, um, I, so I grew up in Australia. Um, I studied graphic design at uni university. Um, okay. You know, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And I still, you know, kind of not know what I want to do. But I graduated university in design. I worked for a bunch of... Uh, web design companies and I worked in video games. So my claim to fame is I worked on Mortal Kombat oh. and designing the user interfaces for like Mortal Kombat, Gauntlet Legends, a bunch of really cool uh, video games back in the days when, when we were young. Um, and then I finished that up. <laughs> I know. So I, one of us is still young, by the way. Um, <laughs> that, that was yeah, me. I met yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, f I finished that up and then I moved um, back to Australia and um, I essentially started a web company and I sold the company. And then what mm -hmm. I ended up doing was I started investing in real estate. Um, okay. these was like single family homes in 2008, 2009. Oh. Um, yeah, I know it was, <laughs> it was, it was timing like, is everything. Is it, everything. Not? it well, um, it was kind of at the end of when things was, were falling over. And then, so yeah. I, I found a bunch a of, lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities. I was buying stuff in Memphis and mm -hmm. Cleveland sight unseen from Australia. Oh my. Yeah. Which is great. I was, you know, we we're getting like 30% net cash returns. It, it was, it was a really great time. And, um, so I had a bunch of properties in real estate. My property managers would come to me and say, Hey, your tenants cause all this damages and it's skipping town. And I'm like, yeah, just get the deposit back. I'm like, well, we didn't actually take photos of the before condition of the properties. Okay. And I'm like, well, why not? Well, it's kind of in a digital camera and blah, blah, blah. They just can't, it was all filed away in a cabinet yeah. they can't find. So I was like, you should use an app to do this. And they're like, what's an app? I'm like, okay, we have a problem. <laughs> so, so, I, so I went around just following some of these, um, some of my property managers, just w watching what they did. And they're like, yeah, we, we take this you know, digital photocopy. We try to uh, take some photographs on the digital camera and then bring it back and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's really inefficient. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a uh, screenshot on an iPad one. It was a app that did, it was for use for inspections. And then I show them this, these screenshots and 20 people I went to visit, 19 of them said, I want this software. And that's how we got started. So we started building the app after they started paying us. Oh, <laughs> for wow. The app. 
Yeah, so that, oh. that's how we got started. Oh, and by the way, that's the best way to start at that point. Yeah, and, and I had no clue how you know how to start a, a, a software as a service company. It was mm-hmm. just like, I thought this would solve my problem as a landlord. Um, we launched it and then we started getting people downloading and using it on just in, in like 50, 50 different countries. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that we got our, that's how we got our start. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, you bring back memories. I remember because um, we had assets up till 2015 and we were – we weren't to market with Resmid yet, so we were full mm-hmm. on a property management company. I know exactly what you're talking about. The yeah. amount of time and energy and inefficiencies around the way we used to do things. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say it was a step up from pen and paper, but I don't think that it was no, actually. I don't think it was, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, uh, like, like things have moved so much since, yeah. you know, that 2012, 13, 14 era. Yeah. Um, like technology has really gone leaps and bounds. And I think the industry, multifamily mm-hmm. as a whole, is like, are getting really good at accepting and using technology. Sure, there's pockets where it's still hard, but mm-hmm. people know that they need technology. Back then it was like, you need technology. Why? Because you do. And now it's like, we need technology. How can you help us? So I think it's really changed in the last 10 years. I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. My yeah. Goodness. Isn't it crazy to think about that? Yeah. So you came to market in 2013? Uh, 2012. And we, we started off selling the single family only because I moved okay. from Australia to I had no idea. Our timelines are the same. Yeah. Because we had our first soft launch in 2012, and the summer of 2013, we had 7,500 units on Roseman. Oh, wow. That, that was it. That, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, compared we, to now. We started selling a single family. We were selling like 50 doors at a time. Yeah. It's yeah. A much and different then mom sale. and pop, right? Yeah. yeah. And then it wasn't until 2016, 2015, we had our, had our first multifamily customer. Uh, and I had no clue multifamily as an industry existed. This is how naive I was. Uh, someone said, hey, uh, so they give us a call and I pick up the phone one day in the office. Like, hey, we have, um, we love your inspection app. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to use it and we have a hundred thousand units. And I'm like, what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> well, we own a hundred thousand apartment units. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, and that's, and he said, well, how do we use your software now on our, on our apartments? And I'm like, um, easy. This can be done really easy. Hung up the phone and just went, oh my God. I know. <laughs> we wow. need to change everything that we're doing. So that's how we got into multifamily. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm curious about, because you came from a, a technology industry, mm-hmm. really, um, albeit maybe not SaaS, but it's a, there's a business model and there's an environment. What's like the biggest thing that would have su- like surprised you about multifamily? Surprised? Um, oh, so many things. Like I think the hardest thing is understanding how multifamily works. Right, like under- and, and really understanding like who are the different players in the space and mm-hmm. you know I, I think like fee managers versus owners yeah understanding that dynamic owner operators um and it just takes people a long time to go oh so the fee managers make the decision but not really mm-hmm. they still have to get buy-in from their owners but you go to the owners they don't want to tell you it's a no so they push you back down yeah. and that just took me a long time to understand that yeah. um but that's probably the biggest thing that like Mm-hmm. Big aha! I'm like, oh wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, let's let's back up for just a second because I don't want to do an injustice here. By the way, w- what's your company? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do again? Um, so, so the company, my company is called Happy Co. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> like, oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Happy Co. Uh, what we do is we sell essentially a range of software and services or solutions, essentially, to the multifamily industry, all the way from acquisition, operation, and disposition everything except for the, the accounting piece because <laughs> you know, trust me um as you don't need to do that that's what you have us for <laughs> exactly well the, uh, there's really great accounting um there's really great ones and not so great ones and resman mm. is in the great bucket so, uh, so there you go so we so, so we have a range of software from like the uh like ma- managing maintenance mm-hmm. managing capex renovations managing uh like uh, the, the resident portal, like, so a bunch of different really cool stuff around the operating piece. Yeah. Um, on the asset management piece, we have some tools for the asset manager. And then we have a um, services arm, which is essentially we call Happy Force, and it's a virtual maintenance offering that we have, and we can dive into that yeah. later on. Yeah, yeah so we're definitely going to. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads into where I was starting with that question, which will now make more sense to our audience. Um, the, the stakeholders... Um, in your solutions and the products mm-hmm. that you provide, there's a wide range of um, computer literacy, I would guess, yeah. and business, you know, acumen and knowledge. So, how has it been for you to learn, um, sort of like work with your teams to, to build products to 
really align with that many stakeholders. Yeah, it, it, it's really challenging. Um, you know, like my, my, my background is in graphic design, which means my parents were really thought long and hard about, will this guy even have a job when he graduates? <laughs> what sort of a career will my son has? He's, he's, he's not a doctor, but um, I, I think what it's taught me, my, my mom and dad are blue collar workers. My dad is a blue collar worker. They, they didn't graduate high school. And so growing up in that environment, you, you learned really quickly, like people just don't know technology. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I think I take a lot of that, the empathy as you go into build products with other people. And when a customer says, oh my God, your software sucks. Everyone gets, some people get very defensive. I go, oh, tell me why it sucks. And, he, and uh, this is a good story. So when we first started the inspection app many years ago, we, we, my co-founder and I, we built this really nice interface. <laughs> we took it to market. And the, the first person uh, that used it, uh, we saw him in the field of maintenance technician doing a, a move out inspection. And I followed him around and he's trying to tap on the screen and he looked really flustered. So I went up to him and said, hey, 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 Jose, what's going on? He goes, this doesn't work. So uh, I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I can't, I can't tap these buttons. They're too small. And then I looked at his hands and I remember shaking his hand and his, his hands were like giant sausages. Uh-huh. And basically <laughs> mine was like a child's <laughs> hand in his, in his big palm. And, and it just dawned on me. I'm like, oh my God, like our interfaces need to be like, I won't say dumbed down, but need, it really needs to be like look, looking outwards at what the end user needs. And in that case, they need bigger buttons. And so I think building software is a lot of it is around empathy and like spending time mm-hmm. with each user. Um, you know, like person that's on the ground on site has a very different level versus someone who's at corporate mm-hmm. level versus a, a investor, uh, you know, an MBA grad who wants data and all that cool stuff. So I think really spending time and understanding who the user is and then um, iterating. So build something, talk to them. They say, oh, that, that really sucks. Okay, tell me why it sucks, oh, X, Y, and Z. Okay, if we did this, would that help? Yep. Mm-hmm. Great. And I think that's just, I, that's probably part of the uh, quote unquote magic of software is just really spending time understanding the user at different levels. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you said that. You just brought back memories. I remember, and hopefully we will, we'll make sure Nick Olson, if he doesn't listen to our podcast at Resman, he's part of our team. Um, he's actually my counterpart, my, my partner in crime over the mm-hmm. years. Um, I just remember the deepest conversation we had once because my eyeballs were in 40 year old eyeballs yeah. and Nick's are 20. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's like, why is that font that small? small. Mm-hmm. I can't read that. And, yeah. you know, we were working through designs, but you're exactly right. Yeah. And I think, too, I really appreciate what you're sharing um, and completely agree about every, you know, um, point of friction, every, you know, feedback, specifically negative feedback, you know, yeah. where, where people are frustrated or sharing those concerns is just such a valuable opportunity. Yeah, I And um, I'm glad to hear you say that, which is probably why we... we yeah. Our great business partners together. We, yeah. we do. We integrate, and we've been integrated for mm-hmm. some time. Um, and I think I first found out about you guys because of your um, solutions for asset managers right, right. and working through the due diligence. And I was just so impressed. Yeah. But you know, when you can take in that feedback and use that as an investment, like R and D, yeah, which is the way we look at it, and apparently so do you. Yeah. Then that's when you deliver something special. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't about what you like; it's about what, what works. Exactly. And <laughs> it, it's a really interesting thing, right? Because um, if you, if anyone who works for Happy Code knows this about me, where I don't really care about the good things. I don't tell, don't praise me because I, don't, I, in, in my mind, I just switch off when someone says good things about me. But when they tell me negative or constructive feedback, that's when I'm like listening. I'm like, I, I need that because if I don't have that, I can't, we can't improve. Yeah. And, and if, you know, like if a customer doesn't tell you why it's bad, then you're going to think it's great, but it's, yeah. And, and I think we can just keep improving. Like there's yep. this, oh my, I can't wait to, to kind of chat about all the, the things that are coming up in, in, you know, AI and all that stuff. But there's so many interesting things that can make the industry better. And I'm, that's why we, we do what we do. Yeah. And that, yeah. if there was, you know, a lot of challenges coming out of the last couple of years, but I think mm. the forcing function about adopting technology, which is really where this whole conversation that we're, we're, we're yeah. diving into now about centralization is really come back around. Yeah. Um, because people are looking at, there are different ways to do things. And, digging in our heels and mm-hmm. you know thinking it has to be this way yeah well why <laughs> well does it really <laughs> yeah and you know where's your give and takes and and how do you save time and how can you reallocate that time yeah. um so yes i'm i'm totally thrilled i can't wait to see how we continue to progress 
as an industry because we were always yeah. in the past and you know this from when you started your company yeah people used to say five to ten years depending on the technology um i wouldn't say we're still at the forefront of technology adopters mm -hmm. um but i could see a day where we could be yeah yeah and you know like there's something that um i tell our team all the time it's mm -hmm. um we, you know, we're not competing against other multifamily vendors. We're competing with the best technology providers in the world. And, you know, I, I'm like, we would be really proud one day where you go on stage and you're in some random technology conference and people go, oh, you know, I wish I could be like Happy Co or, you know, like, and, and be the best in class for this, the, uh, the, the in like this specific industry. Mm -hmm. And like, cause we, we want to, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity because just the, I love the industry. I think it, there's a lot of, really down to earth and nice people that actually work in there. So I, I, I enjoy just hanging out with our customers. Some people don't like it, but I'm like, they're, they're just sold all the earth. We were people. talking about that yeah, at lunch yeah, about yeah. like really what's built up this industry. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, it's kind of the way I feel too, even with our, um, so we have affordable housing software, yeah. which, you know, hindsight 2020, we <laughs> might've leaped into that pond earlier years ago than we probably should have yeah. um, because of just not truly understanding the financial needs, yep, right? Yep. I, you and I talked about that. Yeah. But I can't think of, you know, a more deserving audience than to have people still committed to making their lives better. Yeah. And I can tell from our engagement and, you know, just people we have on the platform that are utilizing your services, you, your company emanates that same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that does make a difference for us all at the end of the day. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I'm guessing you are having a lot of conversations. I think you've been on a webinar or two, maybe another podcast, but I'll forgive you for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Cannot confirm nor deny, yes. <laughs> but this topic, it just keeps coming back around. Yeah. And it's funny, when I was talking to some of our, our uh, internal teams about you and I talking, the conversation about even the word centralization came up. Yeah. Um, and how it's really just become this like catch-all phrase. Um, and I think from the operator standpoint, when, when this board comes up, we're really looking for, you know, in our mind, it's efficiencies, right? Improvements to processes, yeah. um, maybe increasing bandwidth capacity for our teams. Um, but I would say the majority of the time when I, I find myself in this conversation or I walk up into it, it it's highly focused around leasing mm -hmm. and yeah. self-serve, which yeah. are all valuable um, uses of, of technology to centralize your operations. Right. And there's a lot of opportunities there just in general. And I, and that's a whole nother conversation because yeah. even that I think we made like it's almost like we leaned forward mm -hmm. the last two years, but then we kind of yeah. straightened back out a little bit. Yeah, and yeah. it it's not what I thought it would be, but I I think it's more about regrouping and really challenging what we have as options. Yeah. And then how will that move forward? But I don't hear it come up that often when we start talking about the other needs, managing right, right. the physical aspects of the community. Yeah. So and I know that you said, was it centralization 2.0 or maintenance central maintenance 2.0? Central, maintenance centralization. Well, I mean, I, I think it should be centralization 1.0 because, like, I don't think there was a 1.0. Okay. Uh, I, we might, might have skipped. I don't know. But there should be centralization as an overall theme. And then you can go, then the next question is, like, what can you centralize across your business? And then mm -hmm. you just go through each of the pillars. Leasing is one of them. It's obvious mm -hmm. because... Um, that was the first thing to, to go in, in COVID because you still needed to lease, but you just couldn't get into apartments and units. Yep. So I think that was a, that kind of kickstarted everything. And then if you look at, uh, you know, the accounting, right, can you, bookkeeping, can you centralize, like, there's so many, like, I think there's an opportunity to kind of create a virtual, a virtually empowered, I guess, virtual empowered, I don't know, essentially a model where you can outsource as many and centralize as many of these these parts of property management as possible. Mm -hmm. And you can like really drive a very like lean, efficient um, operating model, but it's going to be really challenging. Uh, but I think it is possible. Okay. I, I think, yeah. What do you see as some yeah. of the, the challenges? It, it's, so I, I think if you, you take a step back and you go like, which companies drive centralization really, really well? It's the owner operators, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at like the public markets today, um, rents in the last two, three years have been growing 20, 30% year over year, which is a horrible thing, by the way, because residents can't afford it. Different story. But now rents are growing at maybe 3%, I think, mm -hmm. right? The recent reports. That's probably much better for, for the residents. But um, the other piece is then if you're an owner of assets, the only other way to make it uh, profitable is to drive your bottom line, your, your, your costs down. And 
that I think is the big driver of where centralization came from. Mm-hmm. The the owner operators were like pushing, uh, you know, the the REITs in in, in the industry. Uh, they were pushing for this efficiency mm-hmm. gain. Um, so that's been that's been a really big shift I, uh, that we've seen. Now the now the downward pressure is if the REITs are doing something, all the other owners are going. We need to do that. And then they're telling their operating partners, we need to be more efficient like these guys up here. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the other folks have been starting on the leasing piece. There's there's a really good number of vendors out there that are helping to do that. We just, because we were so entrenched in maintenance, that's where we we decided to go, why don't we help the maintenance side? And so that's what we've done on the centralization piece. Yeah. And I'm yeah. glad to hear you say that because I think, um, you know, we have great partners and and you help us solve for some some of those things that you know, let you be best at what you do and yeah. you are. And that's part of the, the Resmond business model is staying open and, and hopefully they'll say this too, but I think we have really great relationships with all our supplier partners. Sometimes yeah. we play in our own sandbox, but I want to win business because I win business, not because I, I, you know, as a company, we, we put so many barbed wires up and mm. fees and, and we make this so much pain, yeah. you know, for you to try and do business with someone else that you come back to us, but not because you truly valued the product. Yeah, mean, that's yeah, yeah. a bad world. Yeah, that's horrible. Um, and, you know, I understand how that's developed in some companies over time, but I just don't think it's the right way. Yeah. But maintenance is one of those areas that the industry has been talking about for decades, yeah. about the investments we have, you know, it, and I, and, you know, I hear continually about the labor challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have enough uh, technical, you know, um, uh, skilled workers. Skilled workers coming in. To coming the industry, in. Yeah. But I also wonder, like, how much of it is because we're not doing enough to attract them? Are we giving them the right tools to continue to be engaged? And yeah. I think looking at this from a technological standpoint mm-hmm. and then yeah. figuring out how to, you know, utilize maintenance apps, things that, like that that will allow them to centralize. So yeah. thinking about that, because I... I would think this is an easy conversation that people would want to get into. I yeah. understand the apprehension um, because it seems new and change is hard. And yeah, yeah. You think it's going to be hard, but we have such gross inefficiencies out there in maintenance that there is, in my view, there is no place to go but up. Yeah. So <laughs> how's <laughs> that, that for a true. sales pitch? Yeah, that, that, thank you very much for that. Um, no, okay, no, you I, can I, use it. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I totally agree. Maintenance is really hard because you, you can't 100% replace the, the physical aspect of maintenance, right? You can't. Mm-hmm virtualize it to the point where you don't need any more maintenance folks. So I think that that is like, um, and everyone that has tried to come up with, like centralization, there's there's different levels of centralization. Like step one is to digitize your paper processes today. Mm-hmm. And that's a very easy, like so, and I think that's where a lot of the um, vendors or other other partners have kind of lent, re- lean, lent? I don't know how to speak English. Have, have kind of <laughs> leaned really hard. Is that even a word? Lent? Leaned? Oh, I have no idea. Um, so in, in, in leasing, it's 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 around, all right, let's get all our leads off of like these, you know, pieces of paper into a system. And then we, we did that right as well. In maintenance, we built a really great work order solution. We went from inspections to now managing work orders, make ready turns and uh, uh, prevent maintenance, all that kind of stuff. But then I was like, what else can we do? Like, you're right. And, and this, so during, uh, just prior to COVID, I, I went around the, the nation and met with our customers. I remember like sitting in, um, I think it was Mike Brewer from Radco okay. uh, was in, in his office. Of, yeah. So I was in his office and I was like really to kind of sell and pedal my software. And he's like, I'm like, Mike, check this out. And he's like, wait, 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 before you start, um, we have big problems. I'm like, well, what, what are they? We can't even find people. We, we have a 60% turnover on maintenance technicians every year. And I'm like, Okay, so I kind of started to hide my software back in my bag, <laughs> exit exit the front, uh, exit through the back. Um, and it just dawned on me, I'm like, wow, I'm trying to sell software, but they can't even find people to, to use, use them. <laughs> and that was like the big aha moment. Well, it was like the big, okay, go back home and think about it. So mm-hmm. we, we left and I didn't have any solutions. We, you know, try to keep selling our software. During COVID, I remember giving them a call and actually a bunch of our customers. I said, hey, what's going on in, in the maintenance world? And they're like, well... We're not getting into apartments anymore. I'm like, uh, okay, so why? Because we can't get into it. The residents don't want us in. It's it's COVID. And oh, I'm yeah. like, so how are you doing solving tickets? We're doing FaceTime calls. And I'm like, what do you mean? We're just calling them using FaceTime and then we're just our technicians are helping them solve stuff virtually. And I'm like, aha, uh-huh. that's a good one. Mm-hmm. And and then I don't know if you remember COVID, 
um, we never, we don't go to the doctor anymore. We do like a virtual call. Yeah. And telemed. We, yep. Telemed. And if we do have a real... I was ahead of my time. I'm just saying. <laughs> I've been doing that for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Mostly because I just don't have time. <laughs> wait, so you used to do that bef before yeah. COVID? Huh. Oh, yeah. I've been doing it for years just because I travel so much. I was like, I don't have time. How come I didn't know about that? Well, you know, I'm in technology. I don't know what you've been yeah, doing. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> God, you know. Same thing, right? Until mm -hmm. there's like, oh, there's a lump, then you go in and do a proper yeah. scan. But so we kind of look at th that and we thought, hmm, what if we could create a virtual offering where we would hire maintenance technicians and then we would solve tickets virtually? And that's what we, that's what we thought about. And so I think yeah. like there's different levels of that digitization and then what's the next level? Could we outsource that? Could we build like, I don't think of Happy Co as a technology company, okay. Um, which is really we. I hope that our investors don't don't listen to this, uh, because I I think of it as a solutions company, and, and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's technology, if it's like humans. I don't really care. Like as long as you're solving customer problems, then that's probably the main thing. And then you know, because yeah, you know how it affects valuation. Yeah. But I think of it as like let's just solve problems, and the valuation will sort itself out. So. So how did yeah. you get, because I love this idea, yeah, yeah. and that's part of why I was so excited for you to come on, because the um, back in my many decades ago, it's hard to swallow that, but it's true, but, <laughs> you know, the um, I was a terrible manager in the beginning, because yeah. I was a terrible property manager to my maintenance team. Yeah. I often made decisions or asked them for things without understanding really the scope of what I was asking yeah. or the timing of things, um, and I got burned pretty good, and they... They helped me <laughs> learn that lesson. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I love them to this day for it because it really changed my trajectory in the industry because I became what I would call as a maintenance manager mm -hmm. um, where I would put maintenance first, including yeah. even my new hire conversations I would have with my new leasing teams. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to set the you know playing field right off the bat. Yeah. Not too much you're going to come to me and complain about the maintenance team until you do their job and, and you get up in the middle out. of the yeah. night yeah. and yeah. you yeah. deal with the smoke detectors and you're in people's, you know, private space dealing with things. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, we're here to prop them up and we lease apartments. Mm -hmm. But it really changed things because I, I learned um, an awful lot, took the maintenance exam myself. I did not pass it, but I did get a 69. <laughs> that was pretty that's, freaking close. That's a great number. Um, but then again, you really want someone doing maintenance who just got a 69 or 70? No. Okay, that's another thing. <laughs> but especially... Oh, you'd you be know, surprised. Some, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I just... I almost electrocuted myself once. So oh, no. <laughs> I know. I'm like, hmm, maybe not. But it, I just had such an appreciation for it. And I think there's, um, it's such a need. They are really fundamental to protecting the value of the asset mm -hmm. for, you know, renewal start on literally day one of move in. Yeah. Um, so the way that that asset is cared for yeah. is, you know, gives you the right to ask for those rent increases. Now, maybe yeah. not consistently 20 30 percent yeah but you know you do need to grow value there are property there's there's things that happen that we need to make more money to cover from taxes and regulations and things and insurance yeah, yeah, and yeah. all that but i'm interested to see like what was the actual experience like for you to get started on this part of your offering because oh. you do have this you know yeah new offering right that yeah, yeah. allows you to be complement a physical team mm -hmm. with the solution services that you provide so yeah, I would love yeah. to hear some more about that. And and just for precedent wise, like mm -hmm. we don't normally come on Prop Talk and talk about like products per se. Yeah. Um, I try not to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, a big opportunity here for the industry as a whole. Yes. And I yeah, think yeah. you've tapped into something and yeah. I, I just would love to yeah. learn and, more and, about and it. No, normally like I don't like getting on podcasts and or in any like public appearance just to peddle like software and stuff. But I actually felt like this was exciting enough because it really can change the industry right i, and, I agree like, and so that's why like so if any, any of your listeners are listening if they can do it themselves great so this is just an idea to spark ideas within them yes. so i don't think in the long run i think in the long run people start to centralize their own uh, virtualize their own um mm -hmm. staff and we have software for that but um but i think it's interesting to, to kind of shift people's mindset and mm -hmm. the, the thing that i was trying to challenge is the one to 100 status quo which is one oh. technician right manages 100 units and I'm, I keep asking people, like, why? And it's like, it's just the way it is. And, like, yeah, everyone and I go, it's just the way it is. We discussed this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I have several years on you <laughs> yeah. in this space. Uh, it's been that way since I came in in 1995. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the same one per hundred. I'm yeah. like, you what? would have thought we would have revisited. Somebody yeah. should have revisited that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's um, so I think that for us, like, that's the whole thing that we're trying to figure out, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about how, what's the, 
what's the vision of it? It's like, how do we make this one to 150, one to 200? Yeah. Right? Because there's no new folks coming into the, there's very little folks coming into the industry because mm-hmm. they can make 50% more on a construction team just doing one thing. Right. So instead of having to work nine to five after hours, emergency mm-hmm. calls, uh, you know, getting yelled at by residents because, you know, like things aren't happening. Like I would just go, oh, I'm done. I'm going to go work in construction down the road. I just work nine to five. I'm, I'll be happy or eight to three or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I think for you know, to your question, like how did, how did it come about? So we started hiring technicians and that was a, an interesting challenge by itself um in itself but but we we started hiring them and so what our technicians do today is let's say you have a 10,000 unit portfolio we we ingest all of the work orders so let's say it's in Resmen we mm-hmm. actually are able to pull from Resmen right. all 10,000 work orders uh 10,000 units worth of work orders and then our technicians are sitting sitting behind the scenes and they're going hmm that one just came in i'm going to text message the resident and say hey i saw you put in a um garbage disposal issue and then, and the technician is actually sending them a text message within the first seven to 10 minutes on average. Mm-hmm. So normally this would be a 72 hour, wait for yep. it, I'll get back to you. But so our, our, our guys are just sitting there sniping these messages and, and these, these tickets and going, hey, I can, I can solve this. And the resident's going, oh, thank you for responding to me. Are you real? And you know, Larry, we're, our first technician's name's Larry. So everyone's called Larry in this team. <laughs> Larry's like, yeah, I'm real. And can you just take another photo of your garbage disposal? And they take another photo and they're like, oh, this one's easy. And then do you want to jump on a call? And the, the, the resident will be like, yes, let's do a call. And Larry would walk through with the resident. See that red button over there? Yep. Mm-hmm. Press and hold it down for five seconds and hold it, holds it down. Oh, it's working. Yeah, it just needed a reset. And... The, and so total time on that is five minutes? Five minutes, five to seven minutes for, yeah. for something like that, right? Versus oh, man. work order goes in the queue. Mm-hmm. You're signing out work orders. Yep. They tend to do them in, in order or by proximity. Yeah. So you're probably looking at five minutes to, you know, for a level of satisfaction versus anywhere 72 from. 72 hours, At the worst days. case, yeah. yeah, like yeah, yeah. Best case, same day, maybe within an hour or two. Yeah. But that's a big difference. And if you think about like that one, if, if the technician spend, takes an hour, you know, walk, mm-hmm. to, walk to the unit, open oh, yeah. the unit, blah, blah. Go get keys. Go I get mean, keys. you get yeah. all of those things. That's one less hour that they can spend on preventive maintenance or right. whatever they want to do. Or, or someone else is more important work order. Yeah. And, and so we, we're essentially being like out the technician. Or taking your highly skilled maintenance supervisor, yep. who's the only one that is a real plumber, even though he's not a you know has yeah, the title yeah, yeah. plumber but <laughs> we all had pseudo plumbers out there if you've been in property management for a hot minute yeah um but yeah taking that highly skilled labor and putting it into the garbage disposal versus yeah. it's texas and we've got four acs out yeah 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 so that's basically how the, mm-hmm. the thing works and it has a bunch of other um you know other areas where so we start thinking about like what are some of the reasons why uh you know like why it takes so long to do things and one mm-hmm. simple thing is if a light bulb in my unit goes out, whose fault, who, who should be replacing that? Is it me? Is it the, the technician? Like, I don't really know. As a resident, you don't really know, right? And so th- what would happen is the resident will put in a service request or even call the front office and say, hey, th- what do I do? And there's like 15, 20 minutes of just wasted time. So we have like a, re- a property manual. Okay. So the resident can, like a guest book when you go visit an Airbnb, mm-hmm. um, you have this manual that the resident can say, oh, this is actually a... Sometimes it's the property that does it. Sometimes the resident, you know, that, that they may get the resident to do it. So we actually create like a list of rules for each property. Oh, and wow. Th- and that saves another, I don't know, three to four hours so, a week. Oh, know. I can imagine. Do you yeah. find that, is that something that's a new new document you're typically creating? Or yeah. are you seeing? <laughs> you know it, the answer. <laughs> this uh, it, it is a typically a new document. That's what I was... Yeah, it's, it's a new document because no one really has this information. Like uh. it, it's in some SOP somewhere and in the... Yeah, under the binder, or it's in the sixteen-page documented lease. That, by the way, they didn't read anyway, even though they should have. Yeah, so so there is like an area where the resident can actually self self solve or like Mm -hmm. understand what to do in different situations as well. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So what is like? I'm I'm curious about like the scale of that because there's, you know, do you do you see that staying and doesn't even need to stay Mm -hmm. as a person or do you start to build a database that has like AI, right? You've got this understanding of yeah. these are your, your, you know, out of a hundred <laughs> garbage disposal calls, 95 yeah. of them are push the red button. 
Yeah. So we um, really fortunately, because we have about three and a half million units that use our maintenance platform, mm -hmm. um, what we've been able to figure out is like, what are the top 50 most common issues? Mm -hmm. And then when the resident puts in that, you know, hey, garbage disposal is broken, there actually is like, hey, uh, we, the technician then is able to send a message back saying, do you want to solve it yourself? Like here's some a YouTube video, YouTube link on how to mm -hmm. reset it. And the resident says, yes, and it's great. They'll solve it. If they say no, then, then we go, all right, well, we can come out and help you do a virtual call. So that's the sort of process. Yeah. Yeah. So how is the, have you been able to gauge the resident reaction to this? Yeah. So we, we were really worried in the beginning. Um, cus customers are saying, my residents pay so much money. They'll never want to do their own thing. Oh, I could, I could hear the right. objection forming, but then. Yeah. So um, I think out of the box. <laughs> so what we did was we're like, we're like, we hear you. So the very early customers were like, we hear you. Give us a shot. Let us try. And so what we did was we actually surveyed a bunch of residents, uh, got the NPS score, and the average NPS was about 18. Okay. All right. So the net promoter score was about 18. So I'm back up really quick because mm. surprisingly, there's um, not everyone in the industry under always understands the NPS um, spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about that for a second. What so, the scoring actually can go from. Yeah, so it can go from negative 100 to positive 100. Mm -hmm. And the really not easy to use software providers are usually in the minus. So if you're un so it's like how unhappy you are. And you can take that same grading scale and grade pretty much any service out there, Netflix, yeah. Peloton, whatever, or right. Amazon, whatever you want. Um, so the resident satisfaction was in like 20. <laughs> yeah. So it's still, I mean, still pretty decent, but not great. Um, and then what we did was we, every time we solve a ticket, we send a survey to the resident and we did this for like three months, um, over thousands of tickets. And we found that the resident's NPS went from 20 to 80, 80. Oh my gosh. All right. And, and then we, do we dove deeper and said like, why are you happy? And they said, well, it, it, why are you happy? Even though you, you have to do your work yourself. <laughs> and they're like, well, cause normally we have to wait 72 hours for someone to even get back to us. Yeah. I've. I've managed to fix my own problem in five minutes and now I know how to fix the same problem if it comes up in the future. And to them, what they were saying is like, they're, they're just happy that someone acknowledged that the ticket was, was you mm -hmm. know, put in the system. And so it's, it's got a positive impact on the resident like happiness. What we haven't figured out yet is, does that increase your renewals? Oh, um, would you like me to make a yes, hypothesis? Yes, please. Go for it. Because <laughs> in, in the industry, and you know, I've been an, I was an operator for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and from day one, I the message has been what I just said. Renewals start at the time of move in. Yeah. And then one, I think the number one reason, number one or number two reason for yeah. a lease to not renew is because of dissatisfaction with maintenance. Really. And when wow. you dive into it, and there's survey companies I know, like Swift Bunny is is one that we work with, but there's others as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you you dive into it, it's there's a work order at some point that may have been created. Right. Um, maybe it was or was not ever responded to, accidentally marked off, or God forbid, there's still properties out there with sticky notes that mm -hmm. this, there's a pile of them that have slid off behind the desk. Yeah. But in reality, it's a level of dissatisfaction because when you come home and you look at the same broken thing or the same light out or, you know, you you don't work, you work outside of normal um or you're at home outside of normal work hours. And yeah. even though there's email and there's ways to communicate digitally, yeah, there's still this lag time and delay. Mm -hmm. And I think the same challenges we're having in maintenance or in the uh, leasing offices and why call centers, I think, are, are yeah. kind of making a big comeback yeah, yeah. is because there's not enough labor to actually respond. Mm -hmm. And getting the automated, hey, we got this from you, and then crickets. Nothing happens, yeah. No, and that this sucks. is like, <laughs> and, and what's unique about like the products that we have in multifamily in general is it's not a car. Yeah. It's not, it's it's a fundamental need that we help serve, yeah. housing. Yeah. Like I always used to say, like when people come home at the end of the day, and you do the same thing, I probably do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have probably a place we kick our shoes off. We probably have our end of the couch or the chair yeah. that's our place to plop down, and there's that sigh that comes out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we yeah, all yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah. I always thought that, like, in the apartment industry, like, you realize, like, that's what we help provide. Mm -hmm. But you know how you don't provide it? Yeah. When I have to walk through the door and I see that my light's still out, it's or still I see that my smoke yeah, detector's yeah, yeah. still beeping, or there's some maintenance thing that's a glaring eyesore that is just not getting resolved. Yeah. And maybe it's not a level 10, but if I've had a level 10 day, yeah. It's a level it, 10. It, it is, yeah. So I can completely see yeah. why this is such a, I can, 
I'm surprised the number's that high, but I'm glad to hear that it's that high. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then we did a survey earlier on and we asked the resident, what's the number one issue? And I think 92% on that, actually 92% said that they've had a negative experience with maintenance mm -hmm. and we're like, that's pretty insane. So, anyway, so that's how well, we, and we over, yeah. and that, that goes back to what you said though. That's why it was so fascinating to talk yeah. to you because we put, we, if we have the labor shortages, the demand is not going down. The, the volume yeah. of tickets is not going down. In fact, during the pandemic, they went up because yeah. We had so much more wear and tear yeah. at a time in the industry. We had the least, the lowest labor force. Yeah. So you have people with the pressure. Yeah. And so I can imagine like just the bandwidth that this, this could free up yeah. on yeah. their teams to, to, you know, improve mood, morale, yeah. quality of work, because yeah. we all know we, what happens we haven't the even, We haven't even touched after hours yet. So this is the thing that we, we were like. Oh, great. We're solving tickets. So 20% of tickets you can solve virtually. All right. So okay. anyone that implements a virtual, it doesn't have to be ours. You can probably do 20% that are, that okay. can be done virtually. Um, um, maybe like 5% of tickets are repeat tickets. So I put mm -hmm. in a work order two days later, I haven't They're heard duplicates. back. I'm going to put in another one. All right. So 5% you kind of get rid of because now we're, we're doing, doing a triage. Um, the other really cool part is re re maintenance, re technician retention. So they ah. hate their jobs because they have to be on call. And uh, what we found was uh, two out of four emergency after hour work orders are not emergency, hmm. right? So, you, right. So if you think about from a, a technician standpoint, you know, you have to be on call, you get woken up at 2 a.m., you have to go on site, your, your poor family, you know, like oh, your, your kids crying. Yeah. Like, you can't oh get back God, to sleep either. Sleep. And you got to, now you're in the middle of the night <laughs> tired with a very frustrated renter <laughs> yeah yeah and and, and um, two out of so half of them two out of four are, are, can be avoided and so our technicians are 24 7 365 mm -hmm. and they're essentially are triaging these emergency tickets to make sure that they are true emergencies if not then they can handle them or do it tomorrow okay which is like, that's huge that, that's huge right and so mm -hmm. um, imagine if you're so what we're seeing is our customers are saying uh, are putting that saying hey you actually do, you can actually work 50 percent less on emergency mm -hmm. tickets or some number and so it's, it's, a, it's a way to kind of attract new new staff members or then retain the talent that they have so that's another really big yeah. piece and if you think about it from the owner's point of view they're saving a hundred to two hundred dollars per trip emergency ticket trip yes call out fee mm -hmm. and so to them they're like this is amazing yeah. <laughs> they get to save yeah so there's a lot of that that's another one which i'm like wow i didn't even think about that and because i know we have cameras on each other but i'm just going to say no i mean Nothing is making me happier in our conversation today than to see how excited you get know, about talking about your <laughs> products. Know. Because, yeah. you know, again, neither one of us are in nonprofit software, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But I really appreciate, and I can, and I hope, I'm sure the cameras are catching it, the genuine passion yeah. and, and like pride and like what you're doing that's helping yeah. these operators and the individuals like mm -hmm. you it shows for the record oh, thank you so yeah, i'm thank guessing you. that you've never lost a deal because who could say no to that well there's, there's <laughs> i mean there's no like there's no alternative and and, and so one of the questions this, this is okay all, all of that that's really exciting that the really exciting part when we first were like ideating this idea um, and it's come to fruition so our customers go like wow that's a really good enticing offer for the technicians to be virtual mm -hmm. what if you are you going to steal our technicians so the question was like, how do you find technicians? Um, our technicians all have some kind of disability okay. or some reason why they can't work on site. Okay. So, right. So we have, we have this father and son team um, oh. who uh, the son was, I think he, he tore his knee or broke his knee or something on site and he was going to get kicked out of the, the, the property, the rental property. He couldn't pay his rent and he was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. He joined us as a virtual technician working from home. And basically he's so thankful. He's like, oh my God, you guys you know, helped me put food on the table. And so every, and he told his friends who are out of jobs because of some you know, bad back, broken knee, like a, yeah. a veteran essentially. And so the, the part that I get really excited about is that now we're giving these people like a different, like a, an alternative to being on site, mm -hmm. even though they physically can't do it, but they, but, but they still have that passion to help people, right? And mm -hmm. what in their, their craft, which is yeah. solving maintenance issues. So we, ha we hire a lot of um, people that just can't work on site, physically yeah. can't work on site. Yeah. No, that's yeah. a great, and I didn't know that. So yeah. that is, that's all, it's heartwarming. Yeah. But I think about, we've talked about this before in, inside Resmond, the, um, you know, 
the same maintenance um, supervisors that helped me and shaped me as a manager, yeah. albeit I learned the hard way <laughs> because of them, yeah. <laughs> but but I needed to learn the hard way. Um, keeping, up, keeping up with them over the years um, and just understanding, and, and I unfortunately I don't think we do enough to talk about this in the industry, but our maintenance teams over the years have put in so much physically mm-hmm. into their jobs. Yeah. Um, and often when you're going through down cycles or there's upward, you know, pressure on your margins, they're, they're going to continue to push themselves. Yeah. Um, and the end result of that is they get to be my age and older, mm-hmm. their bodies, Can't, you yeah, know, it's, yeah, a, it's yeah. like a football player in some yeah. cases. Cause I, I, a couple in particular, I know yeah. that are, have really struggled. And I just think about what a great opportunity it is. So maybe they don't, they can't be out in the field anymore, but they have so much knowledge to give and so much, um, they still care about the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they have a lot of pride in their work. The, yes. the good ones, right? They yes. have a lot of pride and they, they yeah. It, it's a, I, I just felt like it was a, uh, you know, we, we actually, every week um, we get the technicians to kind of share their story of the rest of the company. You know, and these are like the rest of the company are like engineers, software engineers who are sitting in Australia or like in Canada or wherever it is. And, but, but then we listen to these stories and it's really, you know, cause we always go like, are we really making a difference in this world? And I think that's the one area where I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's very tangible. And you're like, this person like couldn't work anymore. when we're giving them op- like jobs and opportunities. And yeah. um, anyway, so that, that, that's the other piece. That's great. I guess, so I, I, I will be my, I'll be your, I'm, I'm going to be your new brand ambassador. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joining the club, joining the club. So do you work a lot with, um. Do you see adoption? Is it uh, certain asset classes or, yeah. um, you know, uh, size or scale of management companies? Because you know what comes to mind too is like affordable housing. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. So we um, the one asset class that doesn't work well with this is assisted living or senior living. Okay. So and I think it makes sense because if you're uh, elderly, then technology is like definitely not easy for you to even yeah. get, jump on a phone or video call, or whatever it is. Um, but this works across class A, class B, class C. Okay. And so all, um, yeah, we haven't seen any specific like, oh, this doesn't work and this and that. But um, what what actually does really, so what helps this get a lot of adoption is when the, you know, you talk about like uh, technology change right, or process change, the onsite team has to really be bought in in this idea, which which I think is probably one of the hardest pieces yeah. in, in multifamily, right? Because mm-hmm. Um, but then I think when, cause in, initially they, they go, are you replacing my job? <laughs> cause, and, and I think what, uh, what they realize is, oh, I actually get to do, you know, my normal job instead of doing like 180% of yeah. work. So, um, I think it's like, how do you like convince Jose in this case yeah. on the ground? Like, Jose, this is actually good for you. You know like, what you say to Jose? What do you say? Next what? time he, this comes up, I yeah. say, Jose, when's the last time you had time to do your job? Yeah. 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 That's a like good legitimately. When yeah. did you, cause that's the same thing. We, we hear that in yeah. different aspects of online leasing and you know, when, when we look for efficiencies out of centralization. So yeah. when we built the platform, it was portfolio centric. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm really proud. We have people speaking at Resmania next week that went like, we're really, um, at the forefront of centralizing like back in 2013 and 14. Right. Right. You know, yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. have any leasing agents out on site. Yeah. Um, and that's a shout out to Jim at anchor, but, um, you know, thinking about how you can help them overcome these, this perception about taking away from my job. And yeah. sometimes when we get in and we start talking to somebody about like how much time we're going to save per position, um, it's really easy to start a, you know, especially your CFOs, they're going to go, okay, we'll put an FTE salary on that by position it yeah. equates to this. And, oh, look, this is the money we can save by cutting staff. Yeah. And whenever I'm present, not that we don't need to find a way to save money. I'm not saying that, mm-hmm. but I've yet to come across any property team that has ever had the time they need to yeah. actually walk the units to reduce risk yeah, yeah. and to maintain quality like we all say we need to. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yet. Exactly. And I, I still have, you know, friends in the industry. I have, yeah. my, my kids have friends in, out on site. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to have to work really hard to prove to me that that is actually happening the way that it should. So yeah. it's all about giving that bandwidth back in that capacity. Yeah. You know, um, because at the end of the day, these are people's homes. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we want to have a quality environment. And the quality environment mm-hmm. allows you to do other things. Yeah. And I didn't, I, we went, I was so excited. I think we went past it. But there's so much talk right now in the market about um, how are we protecting those rent gains over the last two years? Mm-hmm. Um, we know that's not sustainable. Yeah. Um, you know, I also, you know, yes, rent went up. I think, is, you know, publicly and in the media, we don't always talk about the cost to the assets yeah. that also went up. Expenses have gone up. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing 
oh, property right. taxes and insurance, um, specifically insurance, going through the roof, not mm. well beyond a 30 or 40 percent increase. Yeah. When we talk about, you know, the savings that, you know, when, when CFOs get kind of fixated on where we're going to take that savings and we want to talk about putting that bandwidth back into the property. Yeah. Um, it's super important because right now, if you're going to retain those rent gains, you have to retain the residents. Yeah. And yeah. there's so much focus on how do we remain competitive without having to give away more rent? Yeah. How do I, you know, maybe I can, it's flat this year. Maybe I don't need 3% rent growth from my existing residents, but I don't want to see myself in a position of giving away six, eight weeks free yeah. on a renewal. Right. Right. And, and having a net loss in rent. Yeah. When you have NPS scores and you have mm-hmm. a resident that is giving your scores are 80, 80 yeah. they will pay to stay there because the quality of their living environment, it does matter. Yeah. And I think there's an advantage, if you will, I mean, that's the wrong word coming out of the pandemic because people spent so much time in their home and in mm-hmm. their apartments. Yeah. And while it put more strain on the assets and wear and tear, but it also elevated the importance of these things. Yeah, yeah. And Digital is great and technology is great. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, these are people's homes and they want to feel happy and they want peace of mind. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you put a price tag on that. And hearing your yeah. results, mm-hmm. I can I think that is a um, um, that's just a win win. And, yeah. uh, and if I had assets today, I think that's one of the things I would be looking at. Now, it doesn't yeah. happen overnight. Mm-hmm. But as you start implementing this and you can bring your NPS scores up to that, then that gives you the right to ask that yeah. renter to yeah. stay at the same rate or even pay a little bit more so you can continue to deliver yeah. exceptional service. Not yeah, good, but exceptional. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And that's why I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited about like where this is, like, it has gone so far. And um, yeah, you know, like our, our our kind of vision, I guess, for for Happy Co is always the, to, to elevate, you know, the mm-hmm. quality of living. So that's yeah. really in general, in, in, in general terms of everyone's living, like the renter, the person on site who's working, the, the single mom who... Yeah, you know, is busting a <laughs> butt to, to kind of put food on the table as a property manager. Um, the asset owner, the, the yeah. lend- lenders who lend to this industry, and all that. So that's our kind of goal is to just keep making it better. Because all of that has to do still with centralization. Because yeah. when you're looking at the labor shortages, and you say twenty percent of those work orders, you know, mm. can be solved virtually. Yeah, you can do that from one central location, but you know, having to have the staffing. And to build up that model and do something that's scale scalable, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't know if ever you know that's if you were you said at the beginning yeah. you don't have to use your services it could be any services you could do it yourself, but in reality there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, there's time to learn to scale, yeah. understand those challenges, um, be able to take in the data that you have to be able to kind of be more I guess holistic if that's the right, the right wording for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but thinking about from some of the other. Um, advances and the way technology has changed Mm -hmm. what else like what else is is the challenge for maintenance supervisors today and maintenance teams we know there's a labor shortage but you know is it is it that different than it was when you first started building the solution or is it the same problems that we've had for 10 years and we just haven't solved them yeah it's the same problems like from what we've seen like it's the same problems right Mm -hmm. like we're surprised we come up and we have customers that try to buy our maintenance software and we go what do you use pen and paper and we're like 2023 like so there's still challenges there um i I think what's changed is the importance that the ownership groups are placing on becoming more efficient yeah right and and that that shift because because you know it's because they're not getting the same rent gains (laughs) well no it's it's actually because there's no deals to chase for them oh right you're talking about from the investor from the investor side because they're they're like normally out chasing new new deals buying new assets and now they're like uh, there's nothing to buy, and so they're turning their and attention. And you paid top dollar, by the way. Yeah. In the last two years for that deal. Yeah, and so and then they're turning their attention to the operating side and say, "Can you guys get better at your job?" And and then yeah. they go, "Show us what you've done." Oh, we've done all these leasing, leasing, blah, blah blah initiatives. Great. What else? That's it. Let's have a look at maintenance. So I think that shift in focus is really pushing um, a lot of operators to just get better and look at other ways to kind yeah. of be more efficient. Um, that's what yeah. we're kind of seeing because that's one of the challenges when there's the labor shortage so let's say we've got everything else in place i still have that challenge of you know the traditional staffing model for maintenance yeah um and maintenance teams and you have maintenance supervisor mm-hmm. right your lead technician or assistant yeah um maybe another tech maybe make ready maybe grounds yeah um and some of those i would obviously make sense right where yeah. where they're 
president of grounds, you know, that's the quality that helps curb appeal, helps attract and retain residents. Yeah. So you, you can't maybe centralize that, but is there, are you seeing out in the market or people looking at how to, through t- technology, kind of have a different staffing model yeah. in, uh, I, where they can take advantage of um, uh, the economies of scale in like a specific mm-hmm. region or yeah. area where they have more than one asset? Yeah, yeah. D- Exactly. We're, we're seeing that. So on outside of the Happy Force product, the virtual product, mm-hmm. on our day-to-day product around maintenance, what we're seeing is there's two things that are happening, two trends. One is floating technicians. So if I have, um, you know, like six properties in the similar vicinity, mm-hmm. I'll have like a, a technician that's floating between six properties. Okay. All right. And so then the on-site team member can kind of like doesn't the onsite technician doesn't have to be super skilled anymore because there's like a maybe very experienced regional maintenance mm-hmm. guy who's just floating around five or six properties. So um, that's one area that we're seeing to to get more efficiency. And then the other one is specialization. All right. So your floating technician is actually a HVAC expert. Right. And and then so then uh, if there's a HVAC problem in property two, you want to dispatch your HVAC expert to that property because they're going to mm-hmm. give you like it's, yeah they're going to give you the best bang for buck. So that I think where technology is keeping up to now, uh, you know, and so we, what we've done is we've, we've we thought a lot about workforce management. So how do you dispatch mm-hmm. the right person to the right job? Right. Um, how do you get that regional maintenance guy a view on all six of his properties? So he's not looking at he doesn't have to log in to your point one property at a time. Is there work orders next property? He actually has a dashboard that see that he can see all of the the work orders for his region. Mm-hmm. I think and that that you get more efficiency gains as well. Yeah, and that would make sense. So I'm curious about and I haven't gotten 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 into this conversation, but it's something that I think about mm-hmm. um, because of this as we see people looking at different staffing models in the front office, right? Yeah. Whether you're pulling. So the the role of assistant manager, pulling that offsite, maybe right. having somebody that's, you know, has three or four assets, works out of the corporate office or a satellite office, or the property manager, multi-site managers. I, I know of some customers and and different markets that are looking at eliminating them, the traditional manager yep. position, um, and I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah, and I wonder about the same thing from maintenance because probably more so in maintenance because there's so many, there's so much education that happens between your leads and the rest of the team that takes the unskilled, you know, or green tech, that's probably a fair term, Mm -hmm. but somebody who's a little more green to make them the next HVAC expert or the next, you know, plumbing expert or whatever. And so I wonder, do you you hear people talking about like, how are they going to bridge that? Because I worry mm. we could go so headstrong into efficiencies that we're setting ourselves up for an already existing labor problem, but an even bigger one of lot, even fewer skilled laborers yeah. because we're still building more units. There's a million units in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I think there's just so much vacancy. If you take like, um, you know, we look at this very closely, like a maintenance vacancies, maintenance mm-hmm. technician vacancies. On average, it's about 20% on every property uh, across all the properties and 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 what is happening is i'm basically prop, you know, uh, property management company one is stealing the guy from property management two and then uh, three weeks later property management two goes i'm going to pay that guy you know like uh, one goes i'm going to pay that guy 20 you know 50 cents more an hour and they steal that guy back they're paying sign-on bonuses and the reason is just there's not enough people to, mm-hmm. to solve this it's not sexy to go into in, into maintenance like blue collar jobs it's not cool I, yeah. I think probably a, a different, and this is a different conversation, but I think there should be some way where we, we make, we, we glorify the maintenance technician and, you know, bring it back again. Like it's, it's cool to be a technician. I don't know how we do it. Maybe we, we do like a, um, a calendar, like the firemen do, right. Uh, oh. uh, <laughs> of technicians. Right, that was, I, you forget I was out on site. I instantly had maintenance supervisors popping in my head. I don't know if that was appropriate. <laughs> Well, you, you choose. I'm you like, choose the right eh, one. Who's do Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I cannot unsee this. Um, I don't know, but maybe th- like being creative and think out the box, and how can we like yeah. make it sexy to to join? Yeah. Have you ever read that? Yeah. Um, I know there was a movie about it, but a long time ago there there was a a book that I picked up called Gung Ho. Gung Ho. And there was I think it was a Michael Keaton movie that was made off of it. It really talked about 
how people perceive themselves in, in different roles. And basically this guy's brought in to be the new CEO of this yeah. factory that basically is the bread and butter for the entire town, but it's going under. Yeah. And when he first comes out and he's, you know, his first day, they've got all the investors and there's all these people and they've got his whole schedule filled up mm -hmm. right, about all these meetings, all these executive meetings. And he cancels every one of them, oh. which throws them all into a tizzy. Um, and he spends the next couple of weeks out in the factory with every position. Right, right. And I just thought it was really fascinating. And I learned from it and, and try to embody this to this day. But it's um, it was understanding, like, how people perceive the value of the job that they're doing mm -hmm. has an impact on their overall satisfaction and yeah. um, their engagement, their morale. Yeah. Because, and this is where we kind of changed our terms in my management company, because, you know, when we're looking to hire and we, we throw these terms around about a groundskeeper, yeah. is he really a groundskeeper? Mm -hmm. Or is he actually directly responsible for quality control that allows me yeah. to lease my apartments with less concession so that we lead the market? Yeah. You know, does he, does the person that's responsible for our facilities is he actually like showing and educating them on the like here's the result of the work that you do yeah. versus task management? Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't I don't know that we do enough of that because you know the driving of NOI and just you know in simplest terms when people start thinking that way yeah. maybe I don't walk by that bag of trash because I understand there's been three of them this week and that's three fees that I get to collect that goes into my extra income and that goes to NOI yeah, 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 yeah. and. You know, I think there's a business side of what we're doing that as a maintenance supervisor, as a maintenance technician, if I was learning how to run both sides of the house and yeah. understanding how those two align, I think it makes this a more attractive industry because yeah. people get excited about learning new things yeah, and people yeah. want to understand the, the intricacies of being successful yeah. and being like, you know, proud. I didn't just fix ACs today, yeah. you know. Three of those residents were, you know, leases coming up for renewal. Yeah, I single-handedly and my work save today that, yeah. may have may have helped save that yeah. that uh -huh. revenue. I like I like that. Yeah, it, yeah. Words matter, right? And, and then like the perception of your, yeah. It, it, I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. We're, we're yeah, gonna yeah, work yeah. on something. Okay, I'm gonna figure out something. <laughs> we're gonna work on something oh, together. Really I can cool. feel it. Because <laughs> okay. that's like I said. I think, and that's where I wonder about with your organization about what the future could look like, yeah. because there's. I do think we're going to continue to struggle with labor challenges and, and we probably need to look at pay, but that's a hard conversation to have with investors when you're not seeing the rent growth we saw the last two years. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a vicious circle that we can't get ourselves out of the way. Mm -hmm. But when you can start materially showing or, you know, you have a material impact from, you yeah. know, off offshoring or, you know, outsourcing uh, some yeah. of the, the, the maintenance needs, the facility management needs so that that, back into the property yeah it, it will fall down to the bottom line over time yeah it, it will and, and and i'm i'm very bullish about like where this the centralization mm -hmm. ideas can are going to take the industry because it's going to move it like incrementally but they're going to yeah if you look every every day if you move one inch at a day every day and you look back 30 years you've moved 30 inches right like that, okay i know it sounds really slow but, but no like, but you're so funny oh my gosh how have we never talked before so I you know, know. what I, <laughs> anybody else is gonna laugh right now you many times i've said even an inchworm gets where he's going eventually that's a good one <laughs> that's an one inch, inch at a time yeah 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 <laughs> think of the visual <laughs> yeah hmm, okay i get it i get it <laughs> so, i don't know if more about me and my story makes sense or is more confusing now <laughs> yeah, after no, our no, hour no, together I, I, no. <laughs> Oh, I, where am I? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I'm, I'm really excited. Like, and you know, we haven't even touched on things like AI and and where that mm -hmm. can go. And I think AI is a very um, exciting. Where it's heading is very exciting because I think of AI as giving people like Iron Man suits, mm -hmm. right? So you're not replacing people or into robots. You're actually giving a human being the ability to do ten times more with less. And giving them an extra little superpower. Exactly, super. And and that's what centralization is. But AI can is going to take that even one step further. Um, and we don't see a lot of AI being utilized in maintenance in our in that maintenance tech, right? Yeah. Instead of you know in prop tech, yes, yeah, to some degree. You yes. know, I think the thing that's been eye opening to me is understanding that even in our our leasing environments, mm. there's a difference between an AI driven chat bot yeah. and the chat bot that relies on trees right you've got to figure out how to how, you know how can you use those technologies together yeah and i it's i think in the last year and a half two years we're seeing 
that evolution start, yeah. but I don't know that I'm seeing it as much in the, the maintenance side. The maintenance and, and, side. And, and it's really like not even, um, you know, like people are going, oh, we're going to create chatbots and the AI is the product, but I don't see AI as, you know, sure, it can be a product, but imagine the technician, like when, when they're responding to a ticket on the right side of their screen, it's the AI is going, hey, you know, Jose, th these are the five ways that you can fix this issue because- so um, an internal, an not internal. outward, not consumer, not uh, resident facing. Exactly. Or, or if, could it even be extended to like an on-site technician, right? This is your next work order. You click on it. Uh, oh, it's an HVAC issue. And the AI on the screen is saying, hey, John, when you go in, these are the six things to, to, to fix. And I've seen this, you know, the AI is going, this problem has occurred 20 other times in you know, five other properties. So I think it's these top three things you need to fix. And so yeah. it's guiding them to, to do their job more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I think, so, yeah. are you working with it? Uh, I cannot confirm or deny again, but um, <laughs> I can't yes. confirm or deny anything, <laughs> anything. either. <laughs> Where am I again? Like, no, but it's um, like you can't answer. Why are you asking me that question? <laughs> but, but 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 things like that, well, I, you know, we 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 get really excited about. Yeah, right? I can and, see that. Yeah. So anyway, no, I, I think that's great. I have a speed round for you that I want to uh -oh. I want to go okay. into. But thinking back to well, first off, just thank you. I mm. thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, and we talked earlier about the bar being set. Yeah. So I'm just saying. You might be neck and neck right now. Okay. Papa, you know. Papacitas. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> you're getting there. I get there. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. This is a great way to, to end the week um, mm -hmm. and just getting to know you. I'm just really honored that you're here. Um, and I love your ideas. I love how you're thinking about the space. Um, I have no doubt you're going to continue to do great things. So before we can do my speed round, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is there like, the floor is yours. Like what would, is there anything that we didn't touch on today or that you, you know, that's like you're passionate about or maybe where the company's going, anything you want to share is your time now. Yeah, no, I mean like the, the main thing is like if, if, if what we've shared around the, you know, virtualization, centralization of maintenance is interesting, like visit our website. Like we love to change. If, if, if any of your listeners have better ideas or different ideas on how we can make this better, like reach out to me, like, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not on Tinder anymore, uh, but definitely on LinkedIn. Uh, or, or, you know, our website's happy.co, happyco, happy.co. Mm -hmm. So visit our website um, and just reach out to us. We, I love to, like, you know, shoot ideas and, and just you know, challenge ourselves to see how we can actually solve more, more things. So, yeah. Well, yeah. and like I said, I can't think of a more deserving group of stakeholders than our maintenance teams. Yeah. Um, they are, they truly make or break a, a community. and. Um, you know, I, I was, I was pleased to see a lot of attention and focus on our internal teams that mm -hmm. I think we'd gotten away from as an industry in the pandemic, a lot of concern. Yeah. I know NAA has got, you know, uh, mental health first aid now, um, yeah. that really was kind of came out of a need that was probably there before the pandemic, but yeah. kind of elevated. Um, so I, I've seen some of the blogs and things you're doing and I, I think you're definitely on your own, like causing people to think, and we need yeah. to continue to support and enhance the environments for basically people taking care of our assets yeah. literally and figuratively <laughs> yeah, i agree i agree all right so you ready for your speed uh, round uh, no but let's do it okay. okay all right and if you don't answer one that's okay because okay we'll, we'll move on to the next one so <laughs> first thing is do you have a pet no i used to you used to what did you yes. used to have uh, I used to have a Pekingese. Uh, it's a dog. Okay. Her name was Yumi. Okay. And uh, she was the cutest dog, but uh, we had a we had a kid, and we had to. She just looked really sad, and she, and Pekingeses have sad faces. So yes. We just like grumpy felt, cat. Yeah, just grumpy cat. <laughs> and we just thought, oh no. So we we gave it a um, an elderly lady who was lonely, and she loved like we would always see her down, you know, like near mm -hmm. our house, and she we always play with um, Yumi the dog, and we gave it to her instead. So don't yeah. feel bad about that. I will tell you, I have, so I have a few, but I did have a cat once that I just, God bless Samantha. We ended up giving Samantha, it's the only pet I've ever given away. Yeah. And it's just because she just was not happy in our living environment with our dogs and our other oh. cats. And I gave her to a, an elderly woman mm -hmm. and I'll never forget the pictures she would send back in. She actually would eat with a TV tray next to her where Samantha, Sammy, had her own TV tray, <laughs> and I don't think that cat ever looked like it smiled. Oh, it wow. was elated to yeah, live yeah. with this woman. <laughs> I'm like, okay, oh, we were wow. right on that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what I was going to ask you, though, is but how long did you have Umi? Umi, we had her for like five years. Okay. So the yeah. rest of that question was, if the pet could talk, what would they say about you? 
I just think she said, "Dad, I'm hungry." Oh, I, I think it was, <laughs> was she, she simple. <laughs> she she was very simple and she cared about herself. <laughs> she was All a princess. Right. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so to you, uh, what item is worth spending more money on? What, what item? Like, what's an item that you're like? If you're a frugal person, you're like, eh, but this is the one thing like, oh yeah, I'll spend money on this. Oh man, that's a good question. Um, what's the one item I'll spend more money? I hate spending money in general. Um, <laughs> I'm so frugal too. I know. Is that because we were starving bootstrappers? I, I think so. Like, I we think it's analyze like- analyze everything. <laughs> we remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the one thing? Uh, technology, like, you know, like, like, like an iPhone iPhone or I, actually oh it's under here you mean like the fact that I have a Samsung Z Fold <laughs> oh my goodness what is that okay <laughs> well but you know just like I I think things that actually give you back more time mm-hmm. is worth because like I think time is the limiting factor of everything mm-hmm. right because you you could be super wealthy but if you don't have health and time and like those I think those two things are probably the most important health and time Okay. So I, I buy a lot of things to help me get back time. <laughs> okay. I will agree with that. That's a great answer. Yeah. Um, so what is, okay, well, you may have already said this, but what is something that people often get wrong about you other than you're not Irish? <laughs> oh, um, my, my name. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. You, you got it right, by the way. Yes. So, oh, and you have this cool feature on LinkedIn that, like, I've never noticed oh. that on anyone else until you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, the one where you click and it... The little speakerphone? Yeah, And yeah, it's yeah. you telling people how to say yes. your name? Yeah, so it's... Gin, Greatness. Jindo, Gin and Tonic, and Play-Doh. Um, I, I've been called Jindu, Jindao, Jin... I don't know, all different <laughs> things. Um, and, and I actually don't mind it because I grew up in Australia in the 80s and, and, you know, if you acknowledge my presence, I'm very happy. Okay. <laughs> so I don't I really love mind. your attitude. <laughs> okay, so um, two more. Yeah. What is your go-to stress management technique? Uh, playing soccer. Oh, you still play? I I, tr- I, knew you I try. Played. I try to. I, I mean, uh, I've got a torn meniscus at the moment, but um, uh, I probably play four, five, six times a week, maybe oh, seven. Uh, but depends who's asking. <laughs> what what position do you play? Um, I used to play midfield, but I'm in defense now. I just sit okay. back. I just sit back and just watch people run. Oh, yeah. and, and wait then, for them to come to you. Wait for them to come, yeah, they'll eventually come here. So can yeah. you still headbutt with the best of them? Or oh yeah, do um, a header. I I can. Yeah yeah. I'm, okay. I, I, I'm really good at hitting the ball, and I've recently realized that I think that has very bad effects on memory. <laughs> you, might, you might I, be right on that one. But I don't know if that's age or just me hitting the ball too much. It could, it be, could both. be both. It could be both. Yeah. It could be both. Yeah, yeah. It could be both. both. You know, I have to say, I was not a soccer fan until my son played soccer, mm-hmm. and then I have become I extreme soccer parent, and yeah. he's 27 now, so this was years ago. Yeah. I might have been banished to the parking lot with three other dads at one point. <laughs> it's only happened once, yeah. but it did happen. I'm just going to own it. But I have so much respect for what soccer players do. Yeah. It's like, I think soccer and hockey. Yeah. Like you guys just, they, there's just, and bas- I know basketball runs too, but okay. It, yeah. They, they lumber along too. I'm just going to yeah, call it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like, it's like that field is huge. It's yeah. constant running. Yeah. So yes, it, it, I, I'm it, in it, awe. If I had one regret in my life, it's not being able to play soccer professionally. I got mm. semi pro, but like professionally, that would have been my dream. But oh. it's it's gone now. Yeah, my son played with somebody who made it uh, as a goalie for FC Dallas. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. So he came up yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know a little bit about your story. So some of the same circles yeah. that you were in for select soccer and yeah, yeah, yeah. So it cool. Was, ah, back in the days. Yeah. Yeah. So how's your volleyball? Or um, I don't really. Okay, I was going to give you a tip because you know here in Dallas and yeah. in different parts of the Sun Belt, the apartment associations are very serious about oh. their annual volleyball events. Really? Oh, no, I'm so, not that great. Okay, because I'm, you know, you came here, you helped me. I'm yeah, going to yeah, help yeah. a fellow supplier out. Thank That's, you. It's a great event <laughs> to put a team together. Yeah. I also cannot play. I'm horrid. Yeah. So um, I am the unofficial coach and cheerleader. Oh, w- w- when, when is this event? We just had one. We, and actually, the Resmond team came in. I think we we were third. Okay. Megan was on it. She, she jumped off, but Megan yeah. was on and uh, it was great fun. Okay. Um, but I'll give you tips on it. So if yeah, you want to yeah, yeah. form a team at some point in one of We the... have very good volleyball players. We we did our okay. recent company retreat in Cabo and um there was volleyball and it was very competitive and I was watching like Okay, so wow. forget what I said. I'm right oh, no, you know, into they're not, the happy, they're not they're not <laughs> the the Happy Co Resmond team next year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're useless. We need to join. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then last but not least, what's the best advice that you ever got? Oh my God, that's so much good advice. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the best advice I got, well, there's a, there's a couple, but I'll give you the one I think probably uh, running a company. 
um, what a very early investor said to me, he said, Hey, there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. It's a roller coaster in this and mm-hmm. you know, what you're going to go through. Don't get too high on the highs and too low on the lows. Just let it go. Oh, that is really good advice. Right? Very sound advice. It's very sound and bad for me now because nothing excites me and nothing saddens me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm always in this middle zone, which my wife goes, shouldn't you be more excited about this thing? I'm like, I am. It's just, it's okay. It is what it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know. <laughs> it is what it is. It oh, is my, it I is. love that. It is what it is. That ought to be hashtag. It is what it is. <laughs> Next time I see your team, I'm going to know. I'm going to have all kinds of things to say. I know. I know. Because <laughs> well, and thank you. You're helping us. You're sponsoring at Resmania next week, so we'll get to see them. Very um, so very excited about that. Well, thank you again. You. That's it. You survived the hot seat. I don't think it was that. You know, tough. No, but, you know, I took good. it easy on you. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm thrilled to just get to spend time with you, and um, congratulations on all your success and just doing such a great job and such a great product. And mm-hmm. you know, your happy co it comes through with happy employees because I've met you know, met several of them, yep. um, and happy <laughs> customers, and then that helps us have happy residents. So it yeah. all comes together. I, so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed my time here. This is very fun. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did, and we will see you again next time. Uh, Be sure to subscribe to Prop Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast at. Um, And to learn more about Resmond's property management platform and get more insight on the multifamily ecosystem, check out myresmond.com. Thanks, guys. (laughs) 